right. So um, one of the industries that benefited enormously from these policies is the soda industry. They saved about a billion dollars the first uh, few years after uh, this deregulation. And we often hear about the soda industry benefiting. What we don't often hear about is how the meat industry benefited first from the uh, um, consolidation that began under the Clinton administration and then from the cheap grains. So let me just back up a minute to what happened uh, under the Clinton administration because what Ronald Reagan began, Bill Clinton really finished in terms of uh, allowing the monopolization of industries. And it was under the Clinton administration that we began to see the meatpacking industry uh, consolidate. So that by the mid-1990s, 30% of uh, pork was raised on factory farms. And we saw a lot of other monopolization under the Clinton administration as well. Uh, for instance, the media industry. Uh, at the beginning of the Clinton term, uh, there were 50 large uh, media organizations. By the end, with all of the mergers and acquisitions, there were uh, five large companies. So we saw a lot of these mergers and acquisitions in a lot of the industries um, uh, during the Clinton administration. But um, the deregulation of supply management and joining the WTO in uh, conjunction with this consolidation is what actually restructured the meat industry. So traditionally, people who raised hogs had some hogs. Uh, they had cows, they, they had diversified farms. They raised their own feed. Uh, maybe they had some uh, uh, produce that they raised as well. But there were a lot of different uh, operations on the farm to make it economically viable. Well, after the uh, uh, deregulation of the commodity programs in the mid-1990s and the cheap corn and soy, it meant that the feed that animals eat was extremely cheap. And so it became very economically viable to have these large factory farms where large numbers of animals are kept in you know, horrible living conditions and uh, uh, the feed is bought to, uh, uh, to raise them. So it was the monopolization or allowing the, uh, the meat uh, packing industry to get much uh, more concentrated and not to have a fair market for the farmers to sell into, and the, um, the cheap feed that really restructured the meat industry. In the first few years after this deregulation, uh, they saved about $4 billion, and uh, it became very economically viable to run factory farms and almost impossible to have a fair market so that farmers could actually sell their, uh, uh, their animals into a marketplace where there was uh, competition. So there were some other companies that also benefited from um, this monopolization and consolidation. And I notice that people are looking kind of sleep sleepy with this long uh, uh, history lesson. So I'm just going to try to wake up everybody. And I'm going to ask everybody to stand up. And we're going to have a very short, easy test. <laughs> and basically, I'm going to ask you if you've ever eaten or had a drink of one of these brands. Uh, and if you have, I'm going to ask you to sit down. And then I'm going to ask, after uh, I read this list, for someone to volunteer why I'm actually reading this particular list of brands. OK. Pepsi, Mountain Dew, Aquafina, Sierra Mist, Tazo Sobe, Slice, Lipton Propel, Gatorade, Tropicana, Naked Juice, Captain Crunch, Aunt Jemima, Near East, Rice Aroni, Pasta Roni, Puffed Wheat, Harvest Crunch, Quaker Quisp, King Vitamin, Mother's Lays, Maui Style, Ruffles, Doritos, Cheetos, Rolled Gold, Sun Chips, Sabertones, Cracker Jacks, Chester's, Grandma's, Munchos, Smart Food, Baconets, Matador, Hickory Sticks, Hostess Chips, Miss Vicky's, uh, Munchies, True North, and there are some others. So why did I read that particular list of brands? <coughs> Any ideas? Yes. They're all owned by the same company. That's exactly right. 
They are all owned by the same company. Today we have a situation where there are 20 large food processing companies that control more than 60 percent of the brands in the grocery store. And those brands are owned by PepsiCo. And I think it's very generous to call PepsiCo a food company, right? Because most of those items are not real food. And they've benefited enormously from this both ability to uh, become uh, very concentrated or uh, to have a um, to have bought all of these different companies and to have control of these brands. And they also have profited from having uh, all of these cheap commodities. Now, you know, a lot of times we hear in the good food movement that all we have to do is get rid of subsidies and that the, the dysfunction in the food system is going to be taken care of. And I want to really address that issue head on because uh, I think that we could get rid of subsidies uh, tomorrow, and we actually may, if there's ever a farm bill that's ever passed, which uh, I'm not sure when that, when that might be. But really, uh, it's, uh, this isn't really, this is a symptom of a really sick food system, not really the cause of it. And the evidence for that is to look at how much farmers have actually made. Because we hear that you know farmers are greedy, they're making all this money, they're lobbying for these huge subsidies. But when you actually look at who's lobbying, well, it may be the Farm Bureau, but I'm not sure that the Farm Bureau actually represents farmers. They actually represent uh, a lot of the uh, economic interest of the largest food producers. And I think we have to start dissecting this idea by looking at how many farmers are left. Because part of the problem and how the misinformation about how subsidies are actually benefiting farmers and that farmers are uh, really responsible for uh, you know, lobbying and getting this kind of food system is based on a, uh, a false number of farmers. So the USDA today, I'm getting all caught up in this. <laughs> Um, the USDA says that there are 2.1 million farmers today, but um, we have to look at the way they count farmers because when you look at the whole issue of subsidies, and uh, we often hear that only the 10% largest farmers get subsidies, well, when you have too many f people counted as farmers, it really skews the whole issue of what percentage of people are dependent on them. And I'm not so much trying to defend subsidies, because I do think it's a, it's a symptom of a dysfunctional food system. But I really think we have to uh, look at who lobbied and benefits the most from these subsidies. <laughs> so uh, the uh, um, USDA, out of that 2.1 million farmers, count 1.4 million farmers that make under $10,000 in sales a year. And half of those um, people that they count as farmers, so a third of, uh, of that 2.1, make under $1,000 in sales. And those two thirds uh, of those uh, farmers that make under $10,000 or uh, under $1,000, they have an off-farm income on average of about $100,000. So they're counting, the USDA is counting people who are like my good friend who uh, sells flowers at a farmer's market. She's not a farmer. She sells flowers in the summer. She makes under about you know, $1,000. And she would be counted in those numbers uh, of, of a, a third of that 2.1 million uh, uh, farmers. And then um, the other third are uh, people like my neighbor, who's retired military, has a quite good off-farm income. And uh, he grows grapes. He probably has uh, under $10,000 in sales every year. So um, these people aren't farmers. And uh, they wouldn't receive subsidies. No, I think most of us could agree, should they receive subsidies. So let's look at who actually farms, which is under a million people, uh, under a million people out of that 2.1 million farmers. And a mid-sized farmer has 
uh, sales of between $100,000 and $250,000. Uh, the last time the USDA looked at and did a study of this in 2009, uh, these mid-sized farmers had an average income of $19.2,000 and half of that came from some kind of government subsidy. Uh, the next largest category of farm, or a large farmer, has um, sales of between um, $250,000 and $500,000, or half a million dollars. They have an average income of $50,000. 17,000 of that is from a government subsidy. We have about 115,000 or 115,000 yeah, farms that are very, very large and have sales of over a um, million dollars. And they uh, uh, have an average income of about $260,000, and a large chunk of that does come from a government subsidy. So the, the point of this exercise is, yes, the largest uh, uh, farms do get a, a government subsidy. Even $260,000, which is a lot for a farmer, is a lot less than the uh, head of Kellogg, the head of Tyson, the head of the uh, major corporations that have lobbied for these policies and are actually making the most money from them. So my point is, if we really want to point blame at who's responsible for the problems in the food system, we should talk about the consolidation and the real problems that have caused uh, a meat industry that's out of control and a processed food industry that's out of control. Because I think in the long term, right, if we're going to fix the food system, we're going to have to work with conventional farmers, right? We need to transition conventional farmers into a sustainable food system, not demonize them, not have environmental groups point their fingers at conventional farmers and say, you are the problem with the food system. Because really, when you look at who's lobbied for these uh, um, policies, it's really the largest companies that have benefited from the kind of food system that we have today. Mm -hmm.